Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. In honor of Simchat Torah today, the rejoicing in the Torah and the re-rolling, the rewinding of the scroll of, from, from the end of De- Deuteronomy back to Genesis 1, which we did today. Uh, and in honor of all this, I want us to take a closer look at this most famous of all the chapters in the whole Bible, uh, Genesis 1, uh, and what it means for us to be created in God's image. So let's read together Genesis 126 uh, through Genesis 2 verse 3, and we'll put it on the overhead as well. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds of the sky, and the livestock, and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air and the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has a breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he'd made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So this is a famous passage about how God made us in his image and his likeness. Uh, and, and indeed, the, in, in Latin, the Imago Dei, or in, in Hebrew, the B'Tselem Elohim, or in English, the image of God. Uh, uh, this is a major theme that runs throughout the whole Bible. So today, I want us to look more deeply at what it means for us to be created B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God, in the image of likeness of the Lord. And I'd like us to look at this under three headings we'll put on the overhead. Number one, the importance of being in God's image. Secondly, the meaning of being in the image of God. And then thirdly, the renovation or the repair of the image of God in, within us, within you and me. So we're going to look at, at, at the importance of the concept of being made in God's image, uh, the meaning of it, and the renovation of, of the Imago Dei, of the image of God in us. So number one, the importance of this concept. Now this is not just some archaic doctrine like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. No, this is, a, this is crucial for the way in which we're to live our lives in the world right now. Let me show you four crucial implications. The Bible says that every human being is made in the image of likeness, in the likeness of God. What does this mean? So first implication, we'll put on the overhead, is our self-image. The Bible says no matter who you are, uh, or where you're from, uh, or what your record is, it doesn't matter what you've done or how low you've gone, every human being is made in the image of God and thus reflects God. And therefore, there's a rock-solid, objective, irreducible glory and significance about you and about every human being that there is. There's a rock-solid, objective, irreducible glory and value and worth to you and to every human being, every one of you, every person. Now, why is that truth so crucial in our culture today? I'll tell you why. Recently, there was a, a resident training to be a, a, a psychiatrist, a doctor in a teaching hospital, and he's doing his rounds with a group of fellow residents uh, under the leadership of, of the head physician on the staff. And they were discussing a particular case, and the particular patient they were discovering, they were discussing was suffering from depression. And, and one of the residents, who was a believer, said, well, one of the things we can do to simply reassure her that she's a valuable, worthwhile human being uh, they just tell her that she has dignity as a human being, that she's valuable and worthwhile. And the head physician, the head psychiatrist, uh, psychiatrist turns to him and says, how do you know that? And then all the residents started murmuring among themselves and thinking he was joking at first. And then he, he assured them he wasn't joking. He said, we're scientists here. Science says that human beings are simply more complex than other beings. 
But there's absolutely no scientific basis for saying that you have dignity or value or worth. Don't push your religious views on this person. And by the way, he's actually right. There's absolutely no purely scientific basis for saying human beings have, have rights uh, and dignity and value and worth. In fact, the famous 20th century atheist philosopher puts on the overhead, uh, Bertrand Russell, Russell says this, we're the product of random causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. The hopes and fears and loves and beliefs of your mind, they're just the outcome of, of an accidental collocation of atoms. Oliver Wendell Holmes, famous Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in the early 20th century, he wrote this on the overhead again. Scientifically, I see no reason for attributing to a man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. Scientifically, we're more complex but significant. Nature killed us off just like everybody else. So do you see the issue? Because on the one hand, all the secular therapists tell you today, oh, you're so valuable. You have dignity and worth. You're, you're a valuable human being. And yet, the philosophy of secularism has no basis at all to say that. A Christian author, G.K. Chesterton, he sarcastically puts it like this, and put this on the overhead. He says, he says, as a politician, a secular person will cry out that all war is a waste of human life. And then as a secular philosopher, Admit that all life is a waste of time. A secular person goes first to a political meeting where he complains that the natives are being treated like beasts. And then he goes to a scientific meeting where he proves that all human beings actually are beasts. <laughs> but Yeshua faith, because of the doctrine of the image of God, can say to people, grounded in reality, grounded in ultimate reality, that God doesn't make junk. You're in the image of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or, or how, far, how low you've gone. You are valuable to the Lord. You are valuable. So the implications of, of being in the image of God is, number one, uh, it affects your self-image. Number two, it affects the way you treat other people, people that, that simply cross your path. Now, for example, you live, you live in a big, big city. There are people everywhere, right? <laughs> like I said, I just got back last night from being in New York City during the week, uh, and it's there in spades. I mean, people everywhere, right? In your face, packed together like sardines on the streets of Manhattan. You know, you go to the downtown streets, or you go to the subways or the buses of, of any big city, you're going to encounter strange people. People that smell bad uh, and dress weird uh, and act crazy and even shout obscenities out at you in the middle of the street. <laughs> But most of us, you know, we live in the suburbs, we live out in the country, uh, and we're in our cars, and we never encounter these people. But if you've ever taken a big city bus or subway, it's just people intensive. Because the city is a place where there's more people than plants. And the country is the place where there's more plants than people. <laughs> but since God loves people more than plants, he must love the city more than the country. <laughs> and if you want to do evangelism, and reach our people, you're going to have to be willing to go to the big cities because that's where the majority of our Jewish people live. You know, there's over 60,000 people per square mile living in New York, uh, not even counting the people who commute into the city. There's approximately 1.2 million Jews living in New York City, about 13% of the city's population. It's the largest Jewish community in the world outside of Israel. New York City has over 8.7 million people, so it's the largest concentration of the image of God in the country. It's also the largest concentration of the image of God per square mile in the country. So big cities, on the one hand, they get all these undesirable people, but at the same time, they're people loved by God and created in His image. James 3, verse 9. With the same tongue, we praise God and we curse human beings made in His image. These things ought not to be. To disdain, uh, to curse, to condemn, to yell at, to dismiss someone made in God's image, the book of James says we ought not to do. And on on his overhead now, in his famous book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis says this. There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations and civilizations, they're mortal. They'll one day end. 
And their life is to our life like the life of a gnat. It's immortals with whom we joke and work and marry and love and exploit. Everyone someday will be either an immortal horror or an everlasting splendor. We must take each other seriously as made in God's image. The weight of your neighbor's glory is a burden you should put on your back every day. And only humility will carry it. This is what C.S. Lewis is saying. Every person who comes across your path, you need to treat with a sacredness, a, a reverence, a respect for them as an individual created in God's image. You should treat your neighbor with kindness, never writing them off or, or, or disdaining them or dismissing them. But of course, the reality is the opposite, right? The reality is we do this all the time. We dismiss and disdain and disrespect people all the time because we really don't believe this truth. We really don't believe the doctrine of the image of God. We certainly don't practice it or, or understand it. We don't internalize it uh, and see the world through this lens, through this truth. And it says that it's a radical doctrine of the image of God. If we really practiced it, we would treat everyone with grace and gentleness and respect, even reverence. Do you? Do you? So the image of God has implications, number one, for your own self-image, number two, for how you treat others, number three, for human rights, for civil rights. Where do you think the idea of civil rights came from? The idea that every human being has certain rights regardless of your race or ethnicity or national origin or class. They have rights that you can't trample upon. Where did this idea come from? Some people claim it came from, from, from Western thought starting with the Greeks. But both Plato and Aristotle said that some races are born to be slaves. Plato and Aristotle were the fathers of Greek philosophy and Greek political thought. That's Western thought. So, so it did not come from there. So where did this idea of universal human rights, the idea that we take for granted today, where did it come from? Brian Turney, this great medieval scholar from my own alma mater, from, from Cornell University, for over the last 20 years has written a variety of books that has basically proven the idea of universal human rights came from the Bible. And it wound its way into European jurisprudence and, and, and cultural institutions through the church. Because, for example, look at Genesis 9, verse 5. God says, from each man, I'll demand an accounting uh, uh, for the life of his fellow man. Why? For in the image of God has God made him. Wow. You see what God just said there? He said, I'm going to hold you accountable for the life of your fellow human being. Why? Because it's against my rules? Well, it is, but that's not the reason God gives. It's not what God says. He says, because I made man in my image, therefore, uh, there's an inherent worth in every human being. It doesn't matter what the law of the land says. It doesn't matter. I made every human being in my image, God says. And therefore, every human being has rights. Certain inalienable rights, rights that no government can take away. And that's where the idea of human rights and civil rights comes from. It doesn't come from Western secular philosophy. No, it came, it comes from the Bible. And what about the modern American civil rights movement? Where did Martin Luther King Jr. get uh, his inspiration from? Check out this new book just written in the last couple months called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Image of God. The idea that we're all men in God's image was crucial to Dr. King's understanding of human nature and equality. And Martin Luther King Jr., he got this idea from the Hebrew prophets, uh, from Yeshua himself, uh, and from uh, Christian historical tradition. So the Bible was the primary basis of Dr. Martin Luther King's civil rights belief. And he did in one of his famous sermons called The American Dream, he says this, we'll put this in the overhead. He says, you see, the Founding Fathers were influenced by the Bible. The concept of the Imago Dei, the image of God, is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected, an ability to have fellowship with God. And this gives every human being a, a uniqueness, a worth, a dignity. 
And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man, from a troubled white to a base black, is significant on God's keyboard. Amen. Because every human man is made in the image of God. Wow. And where did he get this idea from that has shaped our society? The idea of, of civil rights, the idea of universal human rights, comes from the biblical doctrine of the Imago Dei, of the image of God. Let me press one more thing. What happens to a society uh, that gets its idea of human rights from the belief in the image of God, uh, that all people are created in God's image, what happens to that society when it loses the idea of God? What happens when you have a secular society in which most of the cultural elites say, well, we don't believe in God anymore, uh, and therefore we don't believe human beings are made in the image of God. We just evolved. We're just a very complex animal. Nothing more. Nothing special about us as a species. Nothing that sets us apart from any other living thing. Now, if that's your belief, then how do you ground human rights uh, in the worth of the individual human being? What does that worth consist of? Where does it even come from? What's the basis of it? What makes a human being worthy of rights now that you no longer believe we're made in the image of God? Well, there's no good answer to that question. And therefore, that's a huge problem right now in the academy, in philosophy, in the academic world, in the West. Western culture no longer has a consistent, objective, universally accepted reason for human rights. Because if, if we don't believe in the image of God, what makes human beings worthy of rights and therefore worthy of protection of those rights? So here's what they've come up with now. Here's what the, most of them are saying now. The secular elites, they say, since we don't believe in the image of God, we'll have to, have to ground uh, human rights in what we're going to call capacities. That humans have certain unique capacities. Uh, the reason the human being deserves protection and, and, and rights is because human beings have various capacities, like the capacity to reason. Uh, they have a self-consciousness. They have a capacity to make moral choices. They know right from wrong. They have the capacity uh, uh, for preferences. And because they have reason and the ability to make choices and have preferences, they're moral agents and therefore worthy of protection and they have rights. But there's a huge problem with this whole approach, this secular approach to human rights. Huge loophole. Peter Singer is a secular philosopher and ethicist at Princeton University. He brings it out in his new book. He agrees with, with the secular position that human rights are grounded merely in capacities. And therefore he, say, therefore he says this, he says, I'm pro-abortion. Why? Because the baby in the, in the womb has no real capacities. The fetus in the womb can't make choices. They can't reason. They don't know right from wrong. They can't live apart from the mother. They have no capacities, and therefore they have no rights. Peter Singer says he agrees with all of that, but if that's true, please note that newborn infants don't have these capacities either. They can't reason. They don't have any preferences yet. They can't make moral choices. Uh, neither can see now old people, and neither can mentally disabled human beings. And therefore, if you believe the secular position that human rights come from certain, having certain capacities, then not only do the unborn have no rights, but neither do babies, or the very elderly, or the mentally disabled. So it's okay to kill them all, right? Which is exactly what Nazi Germany did. And it's exactly where we in America are heading. <laughs> when you get rid of the doctrine of the image of God, you had a slippery slope that will inevitably, inevitably lead to untold evil and the trampling of human beings, where we play out the logical consequences of Darwinism, where the strong eat the weak. And a lot of secular elites are now furious at Peter Singer for pointing all this out. And they're furious because he's right. If you don't believe in the image of God, what are you going to ground human rights in? Uh, because um, all the, the, best, the very best they've been able to come up with is this concept of human capacities. But as we've just seen, the unborn, the, the, new, the newly born, or the elderly, the mentally disabled, they, have, they don't have capacities either. So logically, none of these groups have rights that deserve protection. 
That's where the secular doctrine logically leads you. But if you go back to the original Messianic communities and congregations and assemblies of the first few centuries after Yeshua, here's what you would see. Uh, the Yeshua followers came into a Greco-Roman world that also grounded the idea of rights on having capacities. This is where the secular leads get it from today. Aristotle said some races were too emotional and couldn't reason properly like we Greeks can. And he said these other races don't have the capacity for higher reason. And therefore, these other races deserve to be slaves. And in the Greco-Roman world, you had mass slavery. 30 to 40% of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. And put this in the overhead. In the Roman Empire, you had five cultural characteristics. Number one, extensive slavery, 30 to 40% of the population. Number two, terrible poverty. Number three, widespread abortion. Number four, infanticide, which is perfectly legal then and especially girl babies, who are often left outside in the cold to, to exposure to die. And number five, the elderly and sick poor people, who are often also just left to die. And all of this was legal. It was done all the time. But then the believers, then the Yeshua followers come along, and they believe in the image of God, in the Imago Dei. And therefore they fought against all five of these practices and conditions. They were totally against abortion and infanticide, totally. From the very beginning of the Messianic movement, we were against this. Because if you believe we're created in the image of God, you've got to be against this. You have to be, it's a no-brainer. Believers were totally against both abortion and infanticide. Uh, and so here's the fourth implication of being made, the doctrine of being made in the image of God. Number four, I mean, on, the, on the overhead as well. Uh, <clears throat> it's for the, the implication of how we live as a community. Because not only were the original, the early Messianic believers against abortion and infanticide, they also cared for the poor. They cared for the elderly and the sick. They cared for widows and orphans. They didn't make widows remarry against their will. Because in that day, uh, in that day and time, the widows were basically forced to remarry in order to survive, to have to have bread to eat. But the Yeshua followers said, don't remarry just for the sake of money. You know, we'll support you. We'll help you. We'll put this on the overhead. The first century believers, they were champions of women. They were champions of orphans. They were champions of the weak. They were champions of the poor. They were against abortion and infanticide. And they turned the world upside down. <laughs> they put the Greco-Roman culture to shame because of their belief in the sanctity of life. So much so that eventually the whole Western world adopted the doctrine of the image of God. Yeshua followers therefore shaped all of Western culture for good. On the overhead, because when you believe in the image of God, the circle of protected life expands. But if you don't believe in the image of God, if you only believe in capacities or some other alternative, the circle of human rights and protections will continually contract and get smaller and smaller. And fewer and fewer people will be protected. Do you see how incredibly crucial and important this truth of the image of God is? Now, what if we took the image of God Seriously, what would we here at Es Chaim look like? Well, first of all, we'd all agree that, that abortion, except to save the life of the mother, is a violation of the image of God. And we would never support a politician who favored abortion rights. And we would never we could to support the sanctity of the unborn life in the womb. Number two, we would reach out to women who've had abortions with the love and forgiveness of Yeshua. We would not curse or condemn them, but we would share the gospel with them and we would love them. And like the first century Messianic Jewish believers, we would also love and serve and reach out to the poor and the widows and the orphans and the sick and disabled and weak and the marginalized. We'd be a unique community that would supernaturally attract people because we would be embodying Messiah within our community. In our world, there's nonstop violence and crime and immorality uh, and, and, and uh, greed and injustice and hatred. The image of God is constantly being trampled. 
Why do we have war and terrorism and poverty and exploitation and human trafficking, even slavery in the world today? Why do we curse each other, which the book of James says is the violation of the image of God? Why do we disdain and put down and exploit and use and manipulate each other? The Bible says it's because the image of God is broken in you and in me. And because it's broken, that's the reason why, we, because it's broken in us, that's the reason why we don't honor it in others. Because the image of God is broken in us, we don't honor it in the people next to us. And what does that mean? That brings us to this, our second point here in the, on the overhead, the meaning of the image of God. Let's look at what, what, it, means to be, what it means to be made in God's image. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle of the, and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps in, on, on the earth. Now look carefully what this means. What does it mean to be in the image of something huh, in the overhead? It means two things. It means reflection and representation. If I take a canvas uh, and I paint your, your picture on it, uh, we'd want to ask, is this a good reflection of you? Is it an accurate reflection of what you look like? If I create an accurate reflection of you, then anyone, even centuries later, will know what you look like. Uh, because the painting will represent you to them, to the viewer. And what God is saying here is something like that. He's saying, I've created you, human beings, to reflect my glory. I've created you to reflect my goodness uh, and my love, my character. I've made you like a canvas or like a mirror and you're capable of reflecting my attributes, my character. And if you reflect my character properly, you accurately represent me to the whole world and everything in the world. And all life will flourish. So what it means to be made in the image of God means uh, to actually face God, what's in the overhead, uh, to, be, to be in his presence so that we're accurately reflecting him and reflecting his character. And then showing that to the world and bringing about life. Now, how does that work? Let me give you an illustration. If we're made in the image of God, you could say we're like little statues of God, or little paintings of God. Uh, I really don't like that example of that analogy too much. I think a better illustration is to compare us to a mirror. I remember years ago, and on a cold winter's day, out in, I was, we were out in the country, and someone was standing outside with a little with a mirror in their hand. They were capturing the, the, the glory uh, of the sun uh, on the one hand, and then they were angling the mirror down to a pile of tinder and leaves and started the fire with it, enough to generate heat and warmth and even to cook on. That's a great illustration of what God is saying here in Genesis 1. He's saying to us, I want you to so reflect my glory that you will fill the world with it. I want you to face me and be in my intimate presence, face to face, so that my character is reproduced in you. And in the way in which you treat the world, the way in which you treat other people around you will bring life. They will flourish. Now, what does this mean? Uh, because we're in the image of God, it means three things in the overhead. Number one, it means we're relational beings, relational creatures. What do I mean by relational? You know, in many ways, you are your relationships. Uh, you were made uh, not to be the original, uh, but to reflect the original. Uh, you're given, we're given a nature such that we need to be filled with the, with the things out there. Uh, we get our identity not just by our own personal decisions, but by our relationships. You are basically the sum total of your relationships. Now, when you're a young person, you're 25 or younger, you, you don't think you're affected by any outside sources, uh, by social media or advertising or Hollywood. You say, oh, I'm not affected by any of that. You know, I'm my own person. But when you're 45 or 55 or 65, you see you're very much the function of your parents, uh, your spouse, your family, the people you hung out with, the people you grew up with. You're the product of your relationships. Why? Because you're made in the image of God and God's a relational being. He, he's existing from all eternity as Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, so we're deeply relational beings because we're made in the image of a relational being. And that's why, by the way, community, being here in community changes you far more than just sitting alone watching a sermon on YouTube. So being in the image of God means, number one, we're relational beings. 
Number two, it means we're spiritually dependent beings. Let's go back to this idea of the mirror. If we're made to reflect the glory of God, do you know what that means? You know, mirrors cannot produce their own light. Mirrors can only lighten others if, they're, if, they're face, if they themselves are, are facing the light. And that means that human beings will always be dependent on something outside of us uh, to give us our glory. You know, Hebraically, the word kavod, glory, uh, it means weight, worth, significance, uh, importance. So when we say that God's glorious, we mean he's all important. When we say, have you seen the glory of God? We sometimes were referring to his, his effulgence and his brilliance, but also we're referring to the fact that, that he is supremely significant and worthy of our worship. So when we're told we're made in the image of God, we're made to reflect his glory, what that means is you can't generate your own glory any more than a mirror can generate its own light. And therefore you're going to have to get your sense of worth, your value, your sense of significance from the outside. Just try to get your worth totally on your own. Just try. Say to yourself, I don't care what God thinks uh, if, about me, if there is a God. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what anyone else thinks about me. All I care about is what I think of me. All that matters is that I think I'm significant. That's like a mirror trying to light itself. It doesn't work. It won't work. You cannot bestow worth on yourself. You need someone from the outside whom you admire and respect to validate you. Because you're made in the image of God. And therefore, you're a spiritually dependent creature. You see, if you don't, if you don't look to God, if you don't face God with your soul, or you don't face his love, if you don't get your beauty and significance and worth from his love, you're going to have to turn and worship something else. Because you're made in God's image. You're going to have to turn to a human being. You have to turn to, to your family or your job. You have to, have to turn to, to human approval or professional success. You have to turn to something that says you're okay. You have to get your glory and significance from something. Because you're made to do this. You, you can't generate your own approval and significance and, and glory and worth. Uh, to be, to be in the, that's what the, being in the image of God means. So number one, we're deeply relational beings. Number two, we're spiritually dependent beings that have to worship something outside of ourselves. And number three, depending on whether you're seeking your glory and significance and value from God, we're trying to get it from, the, from something in the created order. You're either going to be spreading life or bringing death. Let me show you what I mean. If you know because you're facing God with, uh, with your soul, and you're assured of your value and significance because of your relationship with Yeshua, the Messiah, then when you get into a marriage, you can just serve that person. Of course, you love them, but you, you don't look at them and say to them, you're the only reason I know I'm significant, because you love me. You know, without baby, I'm nothing, right? without you. <laughs> because if you're facing your whole soul towards that person, instead of towards Messiah, if you're trying to get your glory and significance uh, from the fact that this person and this important person loves me, you will crush them. You'll crush them with your unrealistic and unfair expectations that they can never live up to. And they always have to be praising you. Uh, they can never be upset with you. You'll end up either not telling them the whole truth from time to time because you, stand, you can't stand them being unhappy with you, which means you're being a lousy spouse because you're, you're withholding truth from them. Uh, because they need to hear the truth, but in your insecurity, you're afraid to tell them the truth. Or on the other hand, the other extreme, you'll tell them the truth too much, meaning you'll, you'll micromanage them to death. Why? Because in your mind, they've got to be perfect. Because your whole life depends on it. But Yeshua says, if you reflect my glory, if I'm your source uh, of your glory, if I'm the source of your glory, if you're imaging me, then everywhere you go in life, Everything you do, you'll serve people, but you won't use them. Your work will be about the work and not getting a certain self-image. Uh, if you're facing your job as your source of significance and value and worth, rather than facing God as your source of meaning and importance, then what happens? You'll end up overworking. You'll end up lying to get ahead. You'll be utterly devastated by any, any downturn in your employment because the work is no longer just about the work. It's about you. 
But Yeshua says, if you face me, then when you go out into your work, or into your relationships, or into your marriage, or into your parenting, you will serve people instead of using them. You'll bring life. If you're imaging God, if you're facing God, then you're going to get your value from Him. Or if instead you make anything else more important than God, anything, your work, your friends, some, some cause, uh, your achievements, your status, human approval, power, if that's where you're getting your value from, you've broken the image of God within you. And therefore you're going to trample on the image of God in other people as well. But what can be done? This brings us to our third or our last point. The renovation or the repair, put that in the overhead please, of the image of God. The repair, the renovation of God's image. Here's what God has done. Look at uh, Colossians 1, uh, 16. The Son, Yeshua, is the image of the invisible God. It says so Yeshua is the icon or the image of God. John 14, 9, Yeshua says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeshua is the only perfect image of God. You have to look to Yeshua if you want to see real beauty and glory of God. 2 Corinthians 3.16 Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Paul says, Paul says about his fellow Jews who are reading the Torah, they don't have eyes to see it. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, Yeshua, the veil is taken away. And we, who with unveiled faces, all reflect God's glory, are being transformed into His image, from one degree of splendor to the next. What's Paul saying here? What's going to grab a hold of your soul uh, and attract it back to God, so that instead of focusing so much uh, uh, on how you look, or how you're doing, or how smart you are, or what others think about you, whether someone is in love with you, you're instead focusing on Yeshua. Because we're made to image God and to get our glory from Him. But instead, we're constantly looking to other things. So what's going to attract my heart back to God? It's not enough for me just to say, Oh, I've got to make God the center of my life. Yes, of course you do. But something has to attract my soul back to the Lord. And Paul says, If you learn how to read the Bible and see the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah within it, how He has lived the life you should have lived, how he's died the death you should have died. How he's paid the penalty you could not pay. And is calling you now to repent and to trust in him and to spend your very life to him. If you read the scriptures and see Yeshua and what he's done for you and for your salvation, uh, you call out to him and you turn from your sin and you turn from yourself and you turn back to God, that's going to result in your supernatural regeneration. But the God's grace and his mercy... And then I'll begin the process of transforming you into his image, into his likeness. You become a mirror reflecting God's glory as you gaze on the beauty and the glory of God in Yeshua, as revealed in the face of Messiah, who's the only perfect image and representation of God the Father. That fixes you. As you gaze on the image of Yeshua, that fixes his image in you. So that you stop trampling on the image in other people. How does this work? Kind of like this. Yeshua was homeless. He was the, almost the victim of infanticide, right? The, the slaughter of the innocents at, at Bethlehem. Yeshua was poor. When he died, he only had one possession that he owned, his cloak. Yeshua was tortured. He was the victim of, of trumped up charges. He was subject to an illegal secret trial. He was the victim of injustice. He, in a word, was lynched. Even though he was the only perfect image of God in the whole world, he was trampled on. Utterly trampled on. Why? He did it voluntarily. To pay the penalty for your sins. And mine. And when I see that, more than anything else, I then see the true beauty and glory of God. I see a holiness so holy that it had to come and die for me because no other sacrifice would ever pay for all my sins. That's how sinful I am. But at the same time, I see a love so great that he, would gladly, he was glad to lay his life down for me. And when I see that, I'm gazing at his beauty and I'm seeing the glory of God in Yeshua. 
who is the only, he is the only perfect representation of God's glory and his beauty. And that's what begins to, to turn the mirror of my soul away from all these other things and back to God. That's what begins to heal the image of God within me. I begin to more and more center on Yeshua. I begin to more and more image him. And the more it heals the image of God in me, the less I'm trampling on the image of God in others. My holy brothers and sisters of Eskayim, you are the image of God. And your fellow human beings, whether you like them or not, are also made in the image of God. You're in the image of God. They're in the image of God. Act like it. Walk in this truth. Begin today. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand and pray. Amen. The music team to come on up, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this tremendous truth and this tremendous gift that we are created in your image. Lord, drive home this point to us today. Drive home its incredible implications. Help us find our worth and our identity in you. Only you. Lord, we repent for all the ways we've tried to find our identity and our worth in, in lots of other things. Things that, that don't last. Things of this earth. Things that are grounded in the world and grounded in, in the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. Lord, we turn from putting our hopes and trusts and dreams in them. And we turn to you, Yeshua. You alone. And when we see that you, Yeshua, are the ultimate image of God, and that we're to mirror and to reflect you, this will also help us to see the image of God in others as well, in our neighbor. So Lord, help us to treat our neighbor as equally made in your image, and that for equally possessing basic universal human rights, regardless of race, or creed, or color, or ethnicity, or wealth, or, or, or social class, or gender, or education. Help us to properly represent you, Yeshua, and reflect your character and holiness, your compassion, your spirit, your glory. Let your glory, Lord, shine within us. Lord, with unveiled face, reflect your glory. Fill us, Lord, anew and afresh today with your spirit. Empower us, Lord, to be your ambassadors. May your kingdom fully come. We pray this all in your name, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.